Welcome to our Deeper Mondays Bible Study here on this Monday, January the 11th of 2021. I'm Matthew Williams. I'm the pastor at Arlington First Baptist Church. It is wonderful to have you join us for this time of Bible study in prayer. As we begin our time together, I just want to give a word of celebration and praise for the wonderful day we had at Arlington First Baptist Church yesterday in worship together. We had a great number in attendance. I'm very thankful about that. I know COVID has really hit uh, many churches hard uh, during this time. It's hit our church hard as far as attendance. You know, a lot of people have been dealing with this virus. A lot of others have health concerns, completely understandable. But I was so thankful to have those in God's house yesterday that were able to be there. We had a great time just going back through the Word of God in Joshua as we continued in our series uncharted looking forward to charting that course for 2021 in our lives we really saw the key to overcoming obstacles in our life in 2021 yesterday is and we saw that that key was victorious faith in jesus christ we're going to continue next week in our series really facing that that iceberg that is out there what we need to steer clear of in our lives in 2021. And yesterday was a great day in the Lord as well because we had a young lady that had given her life to Jesus Christ that came and wanted to unite with us in fellowship and be baptized. And Miss Maddie Brown had given her life to Jesus Christ. And we just celebrate with her decision to accept Christ as her Lord and Savior. And we look forward here in the next few weeks to her baptism as we'll celebrate again. And I know that you celebrate with us and rejoice over that decision that Maddie has made also. It was just a great day of worship and celebration. I hope that next week, 1030, you can be with us in person at Arlington First Baptist. And we do follow all the CDC guidelines and safety protocols in this time of COVID with social distancing, masks, temperature checks, all of those things. But we have a great time worshiping in the Lord. It's a great safe environment for you and your family to come and just Worship the Lord together with other believers. So I want to encourage you to do that next Sunday, 1030. You be in God's house as we continue in our study of the Word of God, the book of Joshua. Be a great time together. We want to spend a few moments in prayer before we dig back into our study in 1 Peter that we have been in on Mondays for quite some time now. Uh, you know, there are many prayer requests, I'm sure, that are out there today, those of you that are watching and listening, many things that are on your heart. I know that we're continuing to pray about this virus and to continue to pray for healing for those who are sick right now and battling this virus. We're praying for families and first responders, those who are working in those environments and those who are taking care of loved ones who are sick at this time. So we want to continue to pray in that way. And I know also on our hearts, of course, are the events uh, that have faced our nation over the past several days. And we just want to lift our nation up before the Lord. We know the answer is not found in a political party. It's not found in an individual. It's not found in a legislative body. It is only found in Jesus Christ. And so we want to lift our nation up before the Lord. And I just want to ask you to pray for revival. Pray for revival in our nation. But we know that revival will not happen in our nation until it happens in our churches. And revival will not happen in our churches until revival happens in our life as believers. So let's just start there. As you pray for revival, pray for revival to begin in your heart as a follower of Jesus Christ. That it will spread then to the body of Christ, to your local body of believers, the church. And through the church, through the body of Christ in our nation today, our nation will come to know and see Jesus Christ as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we pray that uh, for the entire earth as we are commissioned to go into all the world, speaking the gospel, sharing the gospel, making disciples of Jesus Christ. So you pray for that revival in your heart and pray for that revival in your church and pray for that revival in our nation. And as you pray for that revival, I know as well that uh, many of us, including myself, we have individuals we know, some are in our family, some we work with that have no relationship with Jesus Christ. They, they do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and we are burdened for them. We desire for them 
to accept Christ as their Savior so that they might have eternal life in Him. And so we want to pray for those that are lost. We want to pray that, that we are God's instrument that He can use in their life. We are commissioned. We are commissioned by Jesus to take the gospel into the world. And so as we pray for these individuals who are lost, pray that God will use you and that your eyes will be open to those opportunities, that you'll step into those opportunities to share your faith with someone who is lost and needing Jesus Christ as their Savior. So many things that we want to be praying for today as we go to the Lord in prayer. And I just ask you right now, you just bring those to the Lord. You place them at his feet. For he is a good God. He's a God that hears our prayers and he will answer. So let's pray together as we begin our time. Father, as I come to you now, I thank you, Lord, for the wonderful day that we had in you yesterday at Arlington First Baptist Church. Just seeing a young lady come to know Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior, as she came to know you personally, Lord, and, and she wanted the world to know about it. Lord, I thank you for her decision. I thank you for the new life that you have given her. And I pray, Lord, that we will be faithful as your church to teach her and to help her grow in her walk with you. Father, I thank you for those that were able to be in your house. Uh, Lord, those who, who were able to come together and worship and, and fellowship as the body of Christ in person with one another. But Lord, I'm thankful for those that were able to watch online. And I pray for those that weren't able to be with us because of sickness. Lord, we pray for healing. Some, Lord, I know are facing this virus. We pray uh, continually for healing from this virus. For so many who are sick, Lord. We pray for their families. Give them strength also. We pray for some that are sick today, Lord, battling the illness of cancer. And, and Lord, we pray for strength for them. We pray for strength for their family. And we do pray for healing. Lord, we pray for healing for our nation. Lord, such a terrible time for us as America right now. Lord, I pray that you bring healing to lives and hearts, for you are the only one that can bring true peace. And so I call upon you, Lord, to heal our nation. Lord, may you revive us as your people, that your church may be revived, that, that this nation may be revived through us as your people. And Father, we pray for those who do not know you as Lord and Savior right now. We pray for our loved ones and our friends and our family, our, our work associates and, our, and others that we know, Lord, that, that right now they have no relationship with you. And if their life were to end at this moment, they would spend an eternity in hell. Lord, that is not what you desire. That is not what we desire. And so I pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to work uh, just in a way in their heart that they, they can no longer turn away from you. They can no longer resist you. But Father, they will accept you as the Lord and Savior of their life. And Lord, if you desire to use us as your instruments, as you have called us to, to, to be uh, used by you in this way, Lord, may we have the courage, may our eyes be open to those opportunities and not let them slip by. And Father, now as we study your word, I pray that it be very clear to us what your word has to say. Lord, let your Holy Spirit apply it to our hearts and our lives, that we might be transformed and renewed by your word today. We ask these things now in the power of your name and for your honor and your glory alone. Amen. All right, we jump back into 1 Peter today. 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, is where we will be. We want to look together uh, today in our time at verses 7 through 11. Now, we're going to cover these verses over the next few weeks, but we want to read the entire passage together today. So if you have a hard copy of the Word of God or a digital copy, I want you to get that right now. Open it up, turn it on whatever you need to do so that you can follow along in the Word of God as we study it together today. If you have an opportunity that you can stand where you are to honor the reading of the Word of God, I want to encourage you to do that also. I'm not able to where I am because of the way the camera is, uh, but I want to encourage you to do that. Again, just putting the Word of God in its rightful place in our life. It is powerful. And so we want to honor the Word of God today as we read it from 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, beginning in verse 7. This is what Peter writes. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and of sober, uh, sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. 
Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. As we read these verses today, we, we hear the scripture really sounding a note of warning and a note of motivation. And what does it say in verse 7? The end of all things is near. Now, that's a pretty strong warning, isn't it? It ought to be a pretty strong motivation for us because the end is near. There's some specific ways that we should be living out the will of God in our life. So Peter gives us some very practical instructions in these verses on really how to end our time here on this earth and to prepare ourselves for our eternal time or our eternal life. You could call it basic instructions before leaving earth. Now, maybe you've heard that before. That's the acronym Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. And I believe this basic instruction that Peter gives us here contains a very wise counsel regarding Christian living and Christian ministry. See, God, he's concerned about ministry in our life. He is concerned about our everyday life and, and how we live for him. So Peter, in these verses, writes about some very important subjects, such as the being sober and watchful or serious and watchful in our prayers and to practice hospitality and really, above all other things, to, to share a fervent love with one another. In other words, what Peter is doing here is he turns his attention to practical ministry within the body of Christ. And within these verses that we read, we find four very specific instructions and one specific goal. And we're going to look at those over the next several weeks together. We're going to take them one at a time, verse by verse, and we're going to see these instructions. We're going to look at this goal that Peter gives us. So if you go back to verse 6, before the text we read tonight, verses 7 through 11, you go back to verse 6, Peter is mentioning those who had died, those who were Christians who had died. If you remember, for the gospel is for this purpose been preached even to those who were dead. But now in verse 7, he refers to the imminent return of Christ for his church. In other words, those who are still alive in Jesus Christ. What is there for them? And he refers to this imminent return of Christ. That's what he says. The end of all things is near. You know, another benefit that we see of suffering in our life, if we tie it back to what we uh, we looked at a couple of weeks ago, is that suffering keeps us focused on eternity, doesn't it? I mean, it's when you're going through those tough times. It's, it's when you're facing those difficult days, that, that season of suffering in your life, when you're having all the pressures and the, and the persecution really just pile up on top of you. That's when you long for heaven. That's when you long for the life on this earth to be over and you long to be in your eternal home. You know, when the good times are here, when things are good, when nice things are happening, easier days are all around you, then our tendency is to shift from eternal things, right, in our thinking. We shift away from those eternal thoughts, and we really just enjoy the moment, you might say. But when the tough times comes, when the tough times come, you know, when, when the body hurts, you know, when the heart breaks, when the wallet's empty, that's when we say, hey, you know what, this is not my home. This is not my home. This is not what is eternity for me? You know, maybe some of you uh, began to look at some of those things this past week with the events that unfolded in our nation. You're thinking, my goodness, where is our world going? You know, this world is not our home. And fortunately, the end, as it says here in the scripture today, is near or it draws near, literally. It says it's approaching. It's the same words that we find in James, the fifth chapter in verse eight, that refers to the second coming of Christ. It's upon us. This verse says the second coming of Jesus is upon us. You know, the shortness of the time remaining to, to any of us and all of us really in this life should be a motivation 
to live for and to serve Jesus Christ every day in our life. Because we see really scripture urging us to be prepared for the end of our life, whether it's caused by the return of Jesus Christ or it's caused by our physical death. We should live our life in the fact that our end is near. I mean, we need to have that sign, you know, posted everywhere around us, reminding us the end is near. You know, it's that type of perspective. It's that perspective of saying, hey, my life is brief here upon this earth. I don't have much time here upon this earth. It's that perspective that helps us recognize really how many activities in the life of a Christian really don't matter, right? I mean, so much of the time that we spend in our life as Christians is nothing more than just rearranging the chairs on the Titanic. You know, it really amounts to nothing. It's not going to make an eternal difference. The question of eternity is, when Christ returns, is he going to find us asleep at the switch? Is he going to find us laid back in leisure? Or is he going to find us diligently working to fulfill his great commission, to share the gospel with the world? I wonder, what will he find us doing? What will he find you doing? In this life, in regard to today's modern church, Eugene Peterson in his book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, writes these words. It's not difficult in our world to get a person interested in the message of the gospel. It is terrifically difficult to sustain the interest. Millions of people in our culture make decisions for Christ, but there is a dreadful attrition rate. Many claim to have been born again, but the evidence for mature Christian discipleship is slim. In our culture, anything, even news about God, can be sold if it's packaged freshly. But when it loses its novelty, it goes on the garbage heap. There's a great market for religious experience in our world. There is little enthusiasm for the patient acquisition of virtue. Little inclination to sign up for a long apprenticeship in what earlier Christians called holiness. You know, sadly, I believe that there is so much truth to those words that Eugene Peterson wrote. You know, it's easy to get people to say, yeah, I want Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. It's much harder to get them to live that then on a daily basis. There's a website that claims to predict when you will die, if you go to this website, after you answer a series of questions, you're projected then a date of your death. And that appears on the screen along with a big digital clock that's counting down. And it really is the seconds are just ticking away. And it's all based, of course, on current life expectancy charts. But, but seeing it really there on the big screen, you might say, in front of you really brings it all home. You know, it really hits you right in the face, you might say. You know, as the site says, the Internet's friendly reminder that life is slipping away. You know, Jesus said this, Be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. You know, Jesus says, look, your life could end at any moment. You know, but God in his wisdom, God in his wisdom doesn't tell us the day of our death, nor do we know the day of Christ's return. The Bible urges us then to live for Christ and be prepared for either one. You know, the realization of our future the realization of our future reality, it, it ought to motivate every single one of us to make sure that we have oil in our lamp, that we are ready at any moment. And Peter really gives a, a wonderful prescription to help us become ready for the end of time or the end of our life. And, and I believe if we adopt these guidelines for our life, that we'll be ready for Christ. We'll be ready at any moment. And these guidelines, as I mentioned just a moment ago, is to keep sane and sober in prayer, to have an unfailing love for one another, to be hospitable to each other without complaint, and to keep serving one another. We want to look at the first of those in our time together here just for a moment. And briefly, we come to that in verse 7 
of chapter 4. Let's read that again. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. So the first command, the first command that we see given here that will prepare us for the end of life and ultimately the judgment of Christ is to be of sound judgment and have a sober spirit in prayer. We need we need to advance and deepen our prayer life as believers. You know, for our, our really it's our spiritual vitality that depends upon our prayer lives. If we desire to have a vibrant spiritual life, then we need to focus upon our prayer life. We need to spend time developing our prayer life. You know, what we find in this verse is that Christians really are, are to be clear-minded or to be of sound mind, to be focused. Now, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean what happens in my mind many times is, is I've got this thought over here and I've got this thought and then I've got this thought and then I've got this thought. I mean, if you had those days where it seems like just thoughts are just going everywhere inside your mind, you just can't seem to focus. You know, you never seem to get anything done on those days, do you? Because you have so many things that are distracting your attention. You know, it's the same way in our life spiritually and especially when it comes to our prayer life. So many times... When we go to the Lord in prayer, we are not focused, are we? There's just so many things going through our mind. We're like, this and this and this and this and this. What the Word of God is saying to us today is we need to be very focused, very specific in our thoughts, especially as we come to the Lord in prayer. You know, that's godly thinking. That's really what we're being urged to have here. The mind of Christ, right? That godly thinking, and that is at the heart of communication with God. I mean, how can we know what God's desire is and ultimately the prayers that he will answer unless we are focused upon him? Unless our minds and our hearts are solely focused upon him. That's what it means to be of sound mind. You are focused. You, you have a laser focus upon God and his will and his desire for your life. You know, I believe that is an urgent message for each of us in the world today as followers of Jesus Christ. We need to focus. We need to remember what is most important, and that is the eternal relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. That is our focus, and that focus then carries over to sharing that message with the world. So along with being sane of mind or sound of mind, focused, we're to be sober or self-controlled as well. Now, this means that, that we've not let the ways of the world intoxicate our thinking. You know, it's not just having a, a focused thought. It's not just saying, well, this is what I'm praying for. This is the will of God. It's, it's not allowing the things of this world then to influence our life and our thoughts and our heart. That's what he's talking about here when it says that we're to be of a sane mind, but also a sober mind. It's a self-controlled mind. Simply, it's, it's refusing to lose our spiritual concentration or our alertness. Not only are we a focus, but we are alert. We are ready. We are ready and we are focused. You know, prayer really accesses all of the resources of God. That is what prayer does. When we go to the Lord in prayer, we are accessing all of the resources of God when we go to him in prayer. But we cannot pray properly if our minds are divided due to worldly pursuits. We cannot pray properly if we have ignorance of divine truth, if we don't know what God's desires are, what his word says, or if we're indifferent to divine purposes. Again, what he desires, what, what his plan is. You know, if we have not spent that time focusing ourselves upon God and what his desire, desires are, then we cannot pray properly in our life. And if we want to have a life that is ready for eternity, we need 
this type of prayer life. We need a prayer life that is focused, that is of sound mind and sober spirit, not influenced by the world, but only that which is of God. We have to refuse to let ourselves get distracted and lured away from the things of God by our work, by, by pleasure, by hobbies, by self-interest. You know, it's so easy to do in the world today. I mean, the world offers all of this to us. But Peter says, if you want to be ready for eternity, then this is what your prayers ought to be like. Your prayer life needs to be one that is focused upon God's will. Your prayer life needs to be unhindered by any of these distractions of the world. Christian, I wonder tonight, where are you in your prayer life? How much time do you spend in prayer? You say, well, I don't have a lot of time to spend in prayer. I mean, I, I pray before meals. I, I pray before I go to bed. Maybe I pray in the morning. But I don't have a lot of time to spend in prayer. Why not? Why don't you have the time to spend in prayer? Well, the answer really comes back to the, to the truth that we've allowed all of these other worldly pursuits to overtake the most important thing in our life. And that is our communication with the Lord. That is our time spent with Him. Peter says, remember, your life on this earth is short. You don't have much time here. And your primary goal needs to be preparing yourself for eternity. You need to spend that time with the Lord in prayer. Hey, I want you to know something. It's not easy. It's not easy to push all of those things aside and say, okay, Lord, I'm spending this time with you. I'm going to give you my focus. I'm going to give you my attention, my thoughts, my heart in this time. Nothing else is going to come between us. That's what Peter says we should do. You know, if we want to be ready, if we want to be ready for that moment for Christ to return or that moment when our life ends and we don't know when that might be, then we need to be a people who are focused in our prayers. We need to be a people who are not distracted from our prayers. We need to spend that time with the Lord, seeking His will, seeking His way and His plan in the circumstances that we face in this life. That is a priority. Is it yours? Tonight as we close with prayer, would you make a recommitment to the Lord that you will spend time with Him in prayer? I want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you to spend that time in the morning. Spend that time in the evening. Find those times throughout the day to pray. Paul says that we're to pray continually. It should be a part of our everyday process, our everyday routine. I mean, we should go about praying continually. That's the focus we should put upon prayer in our life. Will you recommit to the Lord that you will do that? That you will spend time with Him in prayer? You see, that is the beginning step of being prepared for Him to return or to meet Him for eternity. So let's begin right now. In this time of commitment, in this prayer right now, focused upon Him. Let's pray. Father, right now, our hearts turn to you. This is time where we push away everything that distracts. Lord, you are worthy of our attention. You are worthy of our time. We love you, Lord. We ask your forgiveness now for neglecting you, for neglecting our time spent with you in prayer. 
You have called us to pray. You have taught us to pray. But Lord, many times we are guilty of not being focused. Not being sound in our mind and spirit. But Lord, we are so distracted. We are so overcome with the things of this world that we just give you a passing glance. Forgive us, Lord. And we recommit to you now in this very moment as we pray to spend time with you in prayer, to commune with you in this way, to seek after your will, your desire in our life. Father, have your way. Lord, break us. Mold us. Restore us. We ask these things now in the power of your name and for your honor and your glory alone. Amen. May we be focused. May we be sober in our spirit and sound of our mind as it comes to prayer. May that be our power source. That is my prayer for you tonight. And I pray that you have recommitted to the Lord to spend that time in prayer. That is the first instruction we're given here in this passage. To be ready because the end of all things is near. As we close today, I want to share with you a couple of announcements, uh, some things taking place here at Arlington First Baptist. Don't forget the third Wednesday of the month, which will be next Wednesday, not this Wednesday, but the next Wednesday will be our Living It Out Food Pantry Ministry Night. So EFPC family, we need your help in restocking our food pantry. If you want to give uh, to, to help purchase items, you can do that. You can do that online. You can drop it by the church. Or if you want to bring items that are needed for our food pantry, you can drop those by the church. Any help is appreciated. Last month really wiped us out. Uh, right before Christmas, so much need in our area. We're thankful for that we're able to help, thankful for the blessings that we receive, but it did wipe us out, and so we need restocking. And you have been so faithful in doing that, and I just plead with you uh, to do that once again. Uh, it won't be this Wednesday, but it will be the next Wednesday as we have our food pantry ministry. Now, also, our FPC Kids Ministry, The Zone, will kick off next month on Wednesday evenings at 6 p.m. So be looking for details coming soon on Facebook and on our website about that. That'll be coming out soon. Also, our FBC students will uh, kick off their Wednesday in person next month. And so be looking for those details about Ignite on our Facebook page and also on our website. So a lot of things taking place here at Arlington First Baptist. Again, we'll be in person for worship this coming Sunday. Hope you can join us 1030 Arlington First Baptist Church. Need an address? 114 East Malls Avenue. You can find us right here in Arlington right off of 41. So hope you can join us for a great time of worship this coming Sunday. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening.